Association. We're here to moderate this session. Fortunate enough to have one of our very own from Oppenheimer, Bobby Tucker, here with us. And he's going to talk about maintaining physical wellness in the brain. Howdy, howdy, everybody. I uh, hope everybody can hear me all right. Everything I'll get in the back, everything. All right, perfect. Yep, so as uh, Kristen just said, thank you so much for introducing me. Uh, my name is Bobby Tucker. I do work at Lunkenheimer Craft Brewing, and I'll be talking about physical wellness in the brewing industry. It'll be a fun time here. Before I do that, though, uh, this giant legal disclaimer here, just a quick breakdown for you guys. If you want to read it later, it's up to you, but I'll just give you a quick and, uh, quick and short of it here. It's essentially that everything that's in here is meant to be just for uh, entertainment purposes. It's not meant to diagnose treat or anything like that, any conditions that might be already pre existing. Everything that's in here is recommended that you get uh, checked out by your doctor before you do it, everything else like that. Nothing I do not is meant to, kind of, like I said, prevent or treat anything like that without the peer approval of a doctor and you get further confirmation for that. Right, so, with that out of the way now, now I can go right into it here. And talk a little bit about myself first, real quick, because I have qualifications here. Um, I've been in the industry for quite a while now. Uh, I've been a personal trainer to friends and family for about nine years and been uh, physically fit and participating in sports long before that. But uh, my main qualifications here are going to be that I have a degree in biology with a focus in medicine. That one's going to be from SUNY Portland. I had a minor in chemistry while I was there. Um, and then I am two semesters away from completing another degree in public health and wellness management right now. I uh, already have minors completed in nutrition and exercise physiology for that one, and that one's going to be from Oswego. Um, and then, as I said, I am a personal trainer. I was a former A certified personal trainer. Um, so I took all my accreditations and everything like that. It's just between school and everything else, I just wasn't able to submit my continuing education credits. But I am still a certified personal trainer and everything else on the side. And so we'll kick it right off. What's that? What is physical wellness? Anyone want to raise your hand and give me a little bit about what they think physical wellness is or what it means to them or anything like that? No, it's not. All right. all right, that's all right. Well, physical wellness is basically just going to be your overall overall physical well-being. That could be everything uh, from your sleep patterns to your diet, to your exercise. It could be anything and everything that has an impact essentially on on your body and how it functions. And so the wellness model that I pre uh, preach and talk about is going to be by this guy right up here. His name is uh, going to be Dr. Bill Hedler. Uh, he is the founder of, or one of the founders of the National Wellness Institute. Uh, and he founded the wellness model uh, that I call the six types of wellness. Uh, they're going to be physical, social, emotional, um, spiritual, occupational, and intellectual. Obviously, we're going to be focusing on the physical, but one given portion of this is not going to be any more important than the other. It is meant to take everything as a whole. And in particular, I did just want to say this model is meant to be that it's an active process. All your decisions, your choices, and everything like that actively play into your wellness. So you are completely in control of what you're doing and how you progress. A couple of quick quotes here. Uh, I apologize. Some of what you mentioned, uh, alcohol and everything like that. I apologize to put that out the way. I'm sorry. I got to talk about it. <laughs> so individuals are encouraged to stay physically fit, consume nutritious foods, establish healthy sleep patterns, prioritize rest and relaxation, and seek out appropriate care from trusted medical and wellness professionals. That's uh, a lot to say there, but all it does really say is just that exactly what I said. Anything that relates to your physical health is going to be important. Anything that can uh, affect your body in any way, your sleep, your eating patterns, anything else is going to be really, really important to focus on and really take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And it also discourages the use of tobacco, vaping products, and drugs along with excessive consumption of alcoholic beverages. All right, I know we're at a brewer's conference and everything like that. We'll go over that last part for a second here. Uh, but you know, us once again, one of the key things that uh, affect people's physical health, whether it be from back pain all the way through uh, foot pain to just being uh, sore and stiff in the morning, is going to be the use of tobacco, baby products, and other related drugs like that. It really does cause a lot, a lot of issues. Uh, so it is very important to just take that statement and really uh, focus in on it a little bit. So with that, we'll be doing a uh, next little part here. I have a little uh, assessment here for everybody. Uh, if you want to take just a quick minute or two here and go through and answer these questions on your own, just rate yourself real quick. Um, typically, uh, if you're in the uh, 26 to 30 range overall, basically, uh, if you're doing scoring fives for almost every single one of these, you are in peak physical wellness, essentially. There's not much else you need. You have it dialed in, and there's not going to be much else you need to do afterwards. 
myself, I took this assessment right now, I am at 25, so I don't even hit that 26 or 30 range. And I preach physical wellness to everybody and everything like that, so it's all right not to be there. It's completely okay. It's like I was saying earlier, it is an active process. So nothing needs to be done in a single day. It can be done for a time. I'll give you all a few minutes. Just, uh, read that and see what your scores are. And if anyone does get a, uh, a score of 30, I uh, just hats off to you. I could never do that. That is, that is amazing. <laughs> Anybody need a little more time? Are we all set? Perfect. All right, so I'll talk about alcohol real quick. I got to get it out of the way. Uh, so, um, Fun facts here for you, about 50% of the U.S. population consumes at least one alcoholic drink uh, in a week, and about 5% of the U.S. population consumes uh, alcohol in heavy amounts over the course of a week. Um, and just so we can all be on the same page there, does anybody know what a standard drink is, like let's say for beer real quick, that should be? 12 ounces of 5%. And so it's going to be 12 ounces at 5, yep. I think it's a four pack of 16 ounce can. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what we all want. That's <laughs> Exactly, yeah. All right, now how about for wine? Anybody know what that one is? Now we got two differing answers here. Does anyone want to stick up and say their answer is the right one real quick? Five ounces. Five ounces wants to stick up? All right, that would actually be correct. Five fluid ounces is a standard for wine. And then the last one, liquor, still spirits. Anyone want to take a candidate at that one? One ounce. One ounce, that's what everyone's saying? Yeah, one and a half, right, here, right up here. That is going to be your full standard serving for liquor distilled spirits. And then, so with that being said, now that everyone knows the pores and everything like that, roughly for men and women, what do you think constitutes heavy drinking? So for men, how many uh, standard drinks of beer do you think they would, or of wine, liquors, any standard drink, do you think they would need to constitute heavy drinking? Five, five or per day? Or week? No, for, per week. Uh, over 14. So we're starting off with the men here. So I got over 14. Anybody else wanna? It's gonna be like seven. Five. Five. Seven. Oh, like seven, you said? Yeah. <laughs> that would be nice, but uh, so for men, yeah, it's gonna actually be 14 drinks uh, over the course of a week. So not uh, nothing too crazy there, but that allows you about two standard drinks a day. If you're gonna have one, just space it out evenly like that. Anyone know what that would be for women now? Ten. Yeah. Going ten. Any others? Any other guesses? Seven, nine. Seven, nine. Twenty-four. <laughs> Twenty-four. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. I see where we're at with the crowd. Like, yeah. uh, so, yeah, so for for women, it's actually going to be seven drinks. So it is going to be a little bit less, and we see a little bit of disparity between men and women, but don't worry, women come back and they kick our bus later on on the next couple of slides, don't worry. <coughs> so with that being said, we'll go a little bit into what exactly alcohol does to your body and in the cells. Uh, so this is a very complex, complicated thing about all different chemicals that react in your cells and everything like that. You are not required to know anything about it, other than the very, very top part there where it says growth factors with those two little towers sticking down into it. Uh, that is the part that alcohol is going to affect. Uh, and in particular, it's going to affect something called the IGF-1 pathway, which is going to be your insulin growth factor. So that insulin growth factor, as you can see in the image of the slide, right into those, fit into those little cups at the top there of your cell, and it would trigger this whole cascade of uh, chemical uh, reactions that would lead to cell growth, proliferation, from muscle and protein being built, a whole slew of things. And alcohol literally just takes those growth factors and reduces them by almost half for chronic users. So your protein synthesis is going to get way outweighed by uh, your protein breakdown. And it's going to cause a large imbalance over the course of a long time. Any questions on that one real quick? I know that one can be a little bit complicated to look at and everything, but like I said, all you need to know about is that growth factor right up there and just what alcohol does to you. Awesome. But there are benefits to alcohol, all right? I promise it's not all bad, so we'll talk about those real quick here. So there are uh, studies that show that uh, drinking the correct amount of alcohol in, over the course of a given week uh, can reduce your risk for cardiac-related events by up to 
Now that's that's a pretty significant amount. I would want to take advantage of that if I was if someone told me I got your I'll end up getting a heart attack or 25% last you just have this many drinks in the week. I'll take that. So we're gonna go into those numbers real quick. Uh, how many drinks do you think uh, a woman should have in order to get the reduced cardiac events over the course of a full week? Any guesses? Going five. Any other guesses here? All right, so five. That is correct. Five standard weeks over the course of uh, over the course of the week. Now uh, here's the here's the fun part though. Women don't really have to don't really have an upper limit to this. As soon as they hit five, they hit receive those benefits and they can keep going past it and they don't have any negatives past that. Past those five percent, if you had thirty drinks, you still get that twenty five percent reduction in cardiac risk. Men, not quite on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so we'll go right into that. How many should uh, men have to get these benefits here? Any guesses out there? Ten. Ten a week. Ten a Less than you want. All right. So going right through, it's only seven on this one. So yeah, you're having one pint, or not even one pint, one standard drink over the course uh, of a day is going to be your health benefits. As soon as you go past about nine drinks over the course of a week, you're going to lose those cardiac uh, benefits gradually as you go further and further. Does this have a standardized like ABV? Like is it? Standard, so yep. So these are going to be standardized drinks uh, as far as like so for beer five percent, uh, uh, for wine it's going to be twelve percent, and then the uh, distilled spirits, I am drawing blank on that. It's going to be 80 proof on that one, so it's 40 to 40 percent. 40 proof, sorry, my apologies. No, no, sorry, okay, I was going to, all right, that's making me, making me question myself. But, yep. uh, so, yeah, so those are the standardized numbers for those standard drinks. Does that answer the question? Or? Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Awesome. All right, so that was all I was going to do about alcohol. I just want to get those, uh, get that out there, show a little bit of benefits on why we're all here. And then we're going to go into a little more about why we're uh, here for the physical wellness seminar, Common Brewery. <laughs> all right, so as you might be able to see from the image here, probably take some guesses, I'm mainly going to be talking about right now lower back pain. It's a common symptom that we all face when from standing on concrete all day or just from walking around constantly being on our feet, lifting heavy objects such as pegs and six wheels and stuff like that. It can all cause lower back pain. So that's going to be the main topic, uh, what I'm talking about here and how we can address those uh, features. So the National Institute of Health, uh, the NIH up here that I have on the, on the slides, uh, is going to recommend uh, active forms of treatment rather than passive ones. What that means is you're not going to be uh, treating with medications or uh, with sedentary lifestyles or anything like that. They encourage you to be up and moving uh, and to use medications as a last resort. So with that being said, they do recommend Tai Chi, yoga, and massages. I'm sure we can all love that last one, massages. I actually I believe there are some massages available here. Uh, yep, so I definitely recommend everybody goes and takes advantage of that. Uh, tai Chi, yoga, and massages, like I was saying, all have fantastic benefits. Massages alone will help your blood flow uh, and keep everything going the way it should. And then just going into a little more facts here for you guys. Recent studies show that exercise can reduce the risk of chronic lower back pain by up to 33%. So now if you can just do regular exercise uh, about three to five times a week, uh, combine that with stretching, that's going to be right into this next point here. That is going to be what your exercise constitutes. So if you can work out three times a week and do light stretching uh, for about 30 minutes a day, that's all it's going to take to reduce the odds you have lower back pain by up to 33%. And then, so going right into it, two major contributors are going to be waking and smoking. I won't talk too much about smoking, but I did put at least a little one slide on here just because I'm sure we're all aware of the negative side effects of smoking, uh, but just a little bit of the science behind it. Uh, essentially, smoking causes uh, exactly what we were talking about with alcohol. It causes that imbalance between protein synthesis and protein breakdown. Uh, it's going to be slightly different than alcohol and how it goes about it, but it actually affects one of the same pathways. Um, and just it causes that imbalance so that your proteins, your muscles should be broken down a lot faster than what they're being made at. And regular protein breakdown and muscle breakdown is, is normal in your body. It's a, it's a regular part of what happens. And so uh, we can't really stop that from happening because it's going to happen to other ones here or not. And so that's just my quick little spiel about smoking real quick there. Then we go right into weight gain, lower back pain, and I know we can manage it. So, Approximately 42.5% of all adults are obese. Uh, 
and that's not even counting the 30.7% of adults that are overweight. Those are going to be two different categories right there. First, you get to go from you're on weight, you're on target, to you're overweight, to you're over obese. And so that means there are more people who are on that far, far end of the spectrum that are even just in the healthy range or even just a slightly above range. That means that over 73% of the U.S. population is overweight in some shape or form. But with that being said, there is a little caveat. Uh, these are all going to be BMI-based numbers, uh, body mass index. So they're not going to be based off your percent fat or anything like that. They're going to be based more off of your height to weight ratios. So they're not going to be as accurate as they could. Uh, or as for uh, there are people who have high BMIs or are incredibly healthy that just have a really high percentage of muscle uh, and to their height ratio essentially. And so with that being said, uh, these numbers take with a little bit of grain of salt, but they have been adjusting over the past few years to switch over to a body fat method on a model. And so about 20% of US, America, uh, US citizens report having lower back pain over the course of the year. That number is 65 million people report having back pain at least once a year. And just having, uh, doing exercise, like I was saying, uh, can you reduce those odds up to 33%. Uh, and then just if you add on to the fact that if you're overweight or obese, the odds of you having lower back pain go up by 32.8 and 71.8% respectively. Those odds, if you can maintain your weight, if you can control it, essentially, the odds of you having lower back pain are going to go significantly down. Alright, so we're going to go right into easy man ways to manage that weight. Uh, does anybody have any guesses on how I'm going to recommend you guys do this in a brewery setting, anything like that? Any guesses that for me? Lift kegs. Lift kegs, that is a good one right there. Yes, we will be talking about lifting kegs and how to properly do that. Any other guesses? No? Alright. Well, diet, yep, diet is definitely going to be a good one. Burning those calories out, is that what I heard? Calories in, calories out. Yep. That's right, so we're not going to make you track your diet or anything like that. We won't go quite into that, but we will get offer some tips and tricks. And I will go actually right into what's going to be on first. It's actually going to be uh, a little bit about calisthenics here, but we'll talk about how we get there first. All right, so exercise and the range that we're going to want to be in. Heart rate zones are going to be your essential qualifier for whether you're healthy or not, more so than your BMI rather than your body fat percentage. It's essentially how healthy your heart is. Um, and as we get more physically fit, your resting heart rate and other numbers like that will actually go down, down, and down, and causing those heart rate zones to also fall with them. You might have heard of Olympic athletes having heart rates, uh, resting heart rates in the 40s, or having uh, heart rate monitors having difficulty even picking up their heart rate because they're not designed to go that low. But they are just that physically fit because their heart can push out enough blood to cover it in that one stroke. So that's what we're really looking for here, and that's going to be our marker for fitness tonight. Okay. And so how we calculate that, uh, that was heart rate ranges and everything like that, it's going to be this fun little formula up here. It's going to be 220 minus your age, minus your resting heart rate, times the percent intensity. So that's going to be the range that you're trying here for. So we're really trying for that zone two to zone three range, as you can see, with aerobic fitness and metabolism and fat loss. Those ranges are going to be pretty easy to hit. Zone two is going to be mostly just walking, light stuff like that on the brewery. Uh, zone three will be just real light weight training exercises that we'll get into as we go on. And we'll be able to really build and build on those. But if anyone wants to take the time real quick uh, to figure out their quick resting heart rate so they can figure out some of the zones themselves. If you don't know how to take your heart rate real quick, uh, there's a couple of easy ways to do so. Uh, one of the ways I like best is going to be is if you just look straight up on it and then you take your finger, your index finger and your middle finger, put it directly behind your ear and follow your uh, chin bone right down to its corner and then straight down into your, into your neck and you'll be able to find your heart rate nice and easily from there. Uh, and if you're gathering your heart rate, uh, just go over the course of a minute, just count, since you've all been seated now for more than five minutes, just count how many beats you get over the course of a minute and that is going to be your resting heart rate. Anyone have any questions on how to calculate that or anything like that? Everyone found their heart rate all right? Everyone looks like they're trying it out? Awesome. All right. So as I was talking before, uh, that zone two, that zone three is right where we're going to want to be. Uh, so the aerobic zone, that 50 to 70 percent range, and the fat burning zone, 60 to 80. Uh, those are going to have that nice little overlap range in that 60 to 70 percent, which is why I actually calculated my personal resting heart rates and heart rate zones here. 
uh, using the 50, 70, 60, and 65. That 60 to 65 range is gonna be the ideal range you're able to hit while you're walking around your group. You don't need to literally go for a run, you don't need to go for a jog or anything else like that. Three and a half, three miles an hour, uh, just a brisk walk will hit those zones right there. And that puts you right into that aerobic and fat burning zones to find that nice little bit of overlap and that's gonna be your key way that you're gonna be able to shred and burn fat off without much of a change at all. You won't need to change your diet, you won't need to change uh, anything else that you're doing other than just adding in this brisk walk uh, for a certain amount of time every single day. And we'll talk about how that time frame works on this next slide here. So the bodybuilder's best cut secret. If you've ever gone to the gym at four o'clock in the morning and you, like right when they open, you'll see all these three, two 300 pound guys on a treadmill bundled up just walking. That's all they're doing. They don't do anything else. They woke up, they fasted, and they went straight to that treadmill and just started walking. And that's their best kept secret. That's how they all get in such great shape. That's how they get so lean for when they're on stage or everything else like that. Number one way they lose fat is walking first thing in the morning. That is it. I'm not telling you to add anything else in or anything else. If you just want to maintain your weight, get your weight under control, this is all you have to do. And so with that, I did break the numbers down a little bit. Uh, so 3,500, you can see on the bottom there, that's approximately one pound of body fat if you're trying to shred it. Uh, and over the course for a person of about 140 pounds, it's gonna take you about, about an hour every single day for two weeks to burn out that pound. But as I was just saying, bodybuilders do it first thing in the morning fasted. There's a reason behind that. You burn almost one and a half times the amount of calories that you would while fasted, not compared to why you had active glucose in your uh, bloodstream from having eaten pork. So if you wake up first thing in the morning, just have a glass of water, go for that nice walk right there, you can, break, uh, you can break these numbers down a lot more. So rather than having to do seven days a week walking for an hour, you only have to do five days a week for an hour. That'll, make, that'll help you lose that weight a lot faster, help you lose those pounds and a nice, safe, controlled manner. Awesome. So just a little bit more about what I just talked about. Uh, but the fun fact for you here, uh, single pound of muscle uh, will burn about six calories a day just by sitting and doing nothing. <clears throat> so if you didn't get up, you didn't move, you didn't do anything outside of your bed over the course of the entire day, that one pound of muscle will burn six calories. That means if you had 100 pounds of muscle, you're burning 600 calories just by doing nothing. So the more muscle, the more protein, and everything, the more you build on with that, the more calories you build to consume, and the more uh, food you build to eat, which if you're like me and you're a foodie, you just want to constantly eat all the time. Uh, so that's going to be the way you do it. It's how to build that muscle. All right. So we'll go into a little bit of some fun calisthenic workouts here. I'm going to get everybody up and moving, hopefully, or at least uh, I'm going to be moving because y'all are going to make me. Uh, so we'll see how that goes here. So a few different exercises, a few different uh, workouts up here. Uh, on the bottom is just going to be this nice little collection of workouts that y'all can do at home and uh, at the brewery or anywhere else. Uh, that you can pick from, to choose from, to design your own workouts based on the exercises that you like. But uh, does anybody want to pick one of these exercises or one of these workout routines here, come up and do it with me or have me do it, anyone else that's feeling brave like that, come up and try one of these out. I'll help coach you, I'll check your form, everything else like that. Yeah, you want to come up? That's not a problem. Do you want to come up as well? Yeah, cool. Sweet, you got three people to come on up. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right, so out of these uh, examples up here, do y'all have a preference on which one we do, or what's that? Do you want to do a plank? Planks it is. All right, so it's not looking at sciences here. We got nice little planks. So I'll get my phone out for a timer. But a nice little, there's a couple of variations that you can do for planks. Uh, all these exercises are going to have variations, modifiers that make them a little bit easier or harder depending on your fitness level. So I'll demonstrate a couple of different ones that we can do for that. Uh, but one of the main ways that you do a plank is you, uh, if everyone hopefully can see me here, is you know, you're going to be down on the floor here. You're going to get right into a push-up push -up position and place your elbows directly onto the floor. From here, you can stay on your knees and maintain this position if you want a little bit easier. Or if you want a little bit harder, you would go up onto your toes while squeezing your glutes and maintaining a nice level back posture. And so from there, I'm gonna invite my guests here to go down and uh, test it out here. Uh, show us their form and see what they have. Oh. 
Perfect. All right, everybody's in position. Oh, we have some great form up here. Everybody's back is perfect. I got the timer started here now. Now let's see if anybody starts dipping a little bit as this timer goes on. You gotta make sure those cores are nice and tight. Make sure you're squeezing your glutes together. I know that's gonna sound funny, but you really do gotta squeeze them together if you wanna engage your core properly. Awesome. Wow, we got some great form up here. We got 10 seconds to go. We're almost there. Awesome, man. Getting a little shaky. I think everyone out shaking right now. Dipping a little bit. Perfect. That's 30 seconds. You're all set. Awesome. You got a pause. That was fantastic. Honestly, y'all did fantastic. Your backs were nice and straight. You stayed engaged the entire way. Everyone was doing the full plank out too. I'd love to see that. So thank you very much. And Callie, we'll all miss it back down. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Honestly, y'all did great. I've never seen that form like that. Went from starters like that, just going right into it. So that was great. Right. And then, is there any exercises up here that you might not recognize or anything like that that you just want me to cover or talk about real quickly? <laughs> the Australian pull-ups. All right, let's see. I don't have a quite have a bar in here for this one, but this one's nice and easy to just tie a little bit of a demonstration on it. So all you're essentially going to be doing is you're going to be finding a bar that is going to be at about chest height here, similar to where this uh, podium is at. And then from there, you're going to be going to uh, holding onto the bar in front bending down directly underneath it and essentially just pulling your chest straight to that bar. It's going to be from, it's called an Australian because it's from down under. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding, that is the reason behind it. Uh, you're meant to be underneath the bar but modifying the angle which you're pulling up essentially to make it an easier or modified version of a pull up. So you're not just pulling your entire body weight, you're only going to be pulling a part of it by using physics and using that lever principle. If that makes sense to everybody. All right. Australian rear delt pulls. Rear delt pulls, that's going to be a similar one for you. So rather than uh, pulling your elbows down to your sides like you would for uh, the Australian pull-ups, uh, you're going to be pulling your elbows almost here, your forehead almost to the bar. So your elbows are going to be pulling directly behind you at level uh, with your head, and you're going to be pulling your forehead directly to that bar that you're pulling up to. This is going to target more of your upper back and transition right into those upper delts, those rear shoulders for you. Push-up negatives. Yep, so those ones are going to be fun. Uh, that is literally just seeing how slowly you can go down on a push-up. You don't need to worry about the weight back up or anything like that. You can roll over to the side. You can do whatever you want to get back up. But just go as absolutely slow as you can on the way down. Because over 70% of the muscle built on exercises is actually done on the negative, on not the positive side, not the lifting side or anything like that. It's done on that slow release. Uh, what's a Bulgarian split squat? Bulgarian, oh, you're, oh, I'm sure you know what those are. You just want me to do one, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, those, those are a lot of fun here. I can probably actually do one on a keg to demonstrate. So this is going to be a fun, one, a fun one for me. So proper form to get into it for this one is you're going to sit right on the edge of your bench or your seat or anything that you have, and you're going to let your feet go out and straight in front of you as much as they can. So once they're straight, that's going to be your foot positioning. You can use one foot to help yourself get up as long as you mark your place with the other. And then from there, you're just going to reach back with your back heel and rest onto that surface behind you. From here, you're going to perform a squat. You're going to go straight down. If your knee stays more over your ankle here, as you, can, if you, if you guys can see here in the main runway, if your knee stays more over your ankle, this is going to work more on your, uh, your hamstrings and your glutes. If your knee is more forward, you're going to shift that pressure onto your quads here. So depending on the angle that you're performing this exercise at, you can actually work your entire leg. And from this position, I don't know, not really back there, you're just pressing straight back up on it, on that lead leg that you had out in front. Does that demonstrate everything all right? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I wish that was, I was a full peg, maybe a little easier so I could take it over, but. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, those ones are fun. They are a great workout. I'm already sweating just from that one right there. <laughs> but they are phenomenal. They are recognized as one of the absolute best exercises that you can do for building your legs and glutes. They're going to be one of those ones that absolutely kill it. Awesome. Any other exercises? I will demonstrate them all if you want me to. So this is your opportunity to see me work. 
Uh, so I'll again. Is the number the number of reps? Yep, so I'll break this down a little bit here for you guys. So the numbers next to them are going to be the number of reps. So you go right through. So like an example one, you would go over the push-ups, do 10 of them, go right into five dips, then go into a nice 30 second wall sit, and then go right into 15 crunches. And then from there, you would take a nice little rest and basically restart that circuit. So you go through the circuit three total times, and that's your workout. Does that make sense? Is our Awesome. Any other questions? Awesome. And I will have this available for everybody. You don't need to like take pictures or anything. If you want, at the end, just put your email in my little book up here. I can send this whole presentation up to everybody so you can go through it, see all the references and everything else like that. Awesome. Next, we're going to go right into brewery exercises. Another opportunity for y'all to make me work. All right, since I'm already sweating out here. This one's going to be a lot of fun. So obviously you can see all the six full exercises and everything I have here, as well as a few different exercises that you can do when in combination. This is actually going to be a sample uh, workout for everybody. I have five days of a workout here. It is broken up so that you do hit every single body part, uh, and these are going to be exercises that will help you in the brewing industry and work on things that you already use and hit every single day. So with that being said, do y'all want me to demonstrate any of these ones? <laughs> we got some lot of fun stuff here. Six little shrugs, curls, bent over, rows, anything like that. Anyone know what any of these are or want to come up and demonstrate them themselves so I can critique or see what your form is or anything like that? What is a six little? A six little? is going to be this guy right here. It's going to be your one six barrel. It's going to be a nice little common one that's found for uh, for personal use or for even just for like samples or bringing out to industry events. So that's the fun part right there. I'm glad someone asked that. I was kind of talking about that myself. So I actually brought one that's partially full and a couple that are empty so you can see the differences between them. But as we know, fluid dynamics, fluid is moving around while you're doing anything. You're going to make it a lot harder to balance or hold on to or anything else like that. So these partials or even full ones are going to have that little bit of movement. And so they're going to work your stabilizers and your joints even a little bit more than what the empty ones will, or even just going to a standard gym would do. So you're actually seeing a little bit more benefit from using these fluid fill pegs than you would if you went to a standardized gym. What's a farmer kick? Farmer kick, all right. That one's fun because that one works uh, your forearms and your shoulders. Uh, this is actually great here. I have a nice little lane, so I can demonstrate this one perfectly. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. We'll take two six stills here. Nice and easy, you're gonna place them on either side of you. You got, you got the handles right in front. You can choose whatever hand position you want on it, whether you're under or over. But essentially, when these are filled or when they're heavy or you have your half pegs, if you're strong enough to do half pegs, uh, grants to you. But, <laughs> but all you're doing is you're just keeping these uh, six fills or the half pegs right down by your side. Uh, basically, arms locked in nice and tight. Even just holding these empty ones here, my shoulders, I can already feel them getting tired just from holding in here. But basically, you're just holding these pegs and you're walking and walking as far as you can until you have to drop these pegs and no longer hold on to them. <laughs> you're walking up and down this aisle as, far, as long as you can, holding these and keeping those shoulders nice and tight. <laughs> and you're just constantly, yes, you do have to do this all day. You bring these things in the house into storage all day, just doing this. And if you get good at it, two six tools in one hand to work your forearms more and not quite be a full pack <coughs> or half pack on that because it's going to be still lighter than your half pack. So you can modify it and do things like that too. This is how I like to carry myself. Right, so, yeah, so these two six tools are still going to be lighter than your half pack. How about the bent over rows? Bent over rows, yeah. That one's one of my personal favorites. So since I haven't done back in a while, I'll do a weighted one of that. So I'll come up in front here so everybody can see me. But nice and easy on this one, you're just gonna take your six tool, you're gonna lay it here on its side so you have a handle on either side of it. So keeping it nice and tight to your body, that's gonna be key as well. You don't wanna let this kite get in front of you or away from you or anything else like that. It's gonna cause a lot of lower back strain and ab strain. So keeping this pack nice and tight, I'm just gonna hinge at the hips, and I'm going to stick my butt out. I know I gotta say it, but you gotta do it. You gotta stick your butt out as far as you can, honestly. From right here, 
you're just gonna let this kite go straight down in front of you. From there, you're gonna have to keep your head up, your back engaged and nice and straight. And you're gonna pull straight to your lower belly button while engaging your lower, uh, your upper back as you're pulling. And so that's it, nice and easy, just a nice straight motion. Pulling in nice and tight and engaging those lats on the back side. That's all you have to do. And that is actually very difficult with fluids. Holy crap. <laughs> But actually, I did go through all these workouts this morning and test them out to make sure they would put you in that aerobic range as well. That's also why I'm tired probably, you didn't think about that. Uh, but they do all hit and they will all push you right into that range there, so I promise they do work. Um, and any other exercise that you want me to demonstrate or anything like that? Yeah, what are the forehead touches? Is that just like... Forehead touches, yep. All right, so simple forehead touches. I didn't want to call them uh, what they're technically called to scare people off, but they are uh, technically called skull brushers. So that is, that is why I didn't call it quite that. But that one's nice and easy to demonstrate as well, so I'll come up again. Just laying down nice and flat on the ground with a kick. Just right up above you, elbows facing forward, and you're gonna allow this keg to come nice and slowly down, and you're just gonna tap it to the center of your forehead, and you're gonna extend straight back up. That's all it is. Nice and easy down, and straight back up. When you do this one with liquid in there, it does become a little pain, right? It's a lie. It becomes what? It does become a little pain, right? It can, yeah, no, so that's why the progression is there. Start off light with an empty one like this, and then go off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing with a half keg. Yeah. So if you can do that exercise with a half keg, I recommend uh, you go try out for competitive strongman contest. Because uh, I'm pretty sure that would probably be a world record if you could. So did you come up with these yourself? Or? Yep, so these are all exercises that I tested out and done myself and everything like that. Uh, there are also things that when I'm carrying for me weight pegs and if I'm out of range with everybody else, I start doing some exercises. But <laughs> have you guys ever like implemented like with the staff to do like an exercise hours or thirty minutes or something? We have not yet or anything else like that, but everyone does definitely come and ask me a million questions about anything they have. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always available to all of our staff and anyone else in the industry or even as people who come into the bar or brewery or anything, just want to talk to me, that's not a problem. If you don't have a YouTube channel where we can just like look at all these exercises that you're like, curious <laughs> <questions. laughs> I don't have all the YouTube channel, unfortunately. I do apologize. YouTube channel, dude, everyone. Hey, if you guys want me to, you can make me do that. That's completely up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get a little bit of revenge on you guys in this next slide when I ask you to do a workout with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we're only gonna do the first two on this one, but I do want everybody to get up if you don't mind, if you want to participate. And we're gonna figure out a couple little exercises here just so everybody's up and moving. I touched the cord, I'm sorry everybody. Hopefully it stays up there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Cool, cool. All right, so everybody is up. Awesome, I like it. So this first one here does say push-ups and everything like that. I'm not going to make y'all get onto the floor or anything. But I will ask that we try these modified version outs and we do the wall push-ups. So if you want to find a section of the wall here real quick, or we can take turns doing them, but all of this is going to be finding a nice, easy angle that you can put your hands right up against to it on, and you're going to be doing those modified push-ups, leaning into it. <laughs> yeah, these are push-ups. Yep, this is leaning against the wall. Yeah, if you increase your angle as you go, the harder it's going to be. But yep, just pushing into it, and it's exploding back up. That's uh, so awesome. I like it. I like seeing the, using the chairs. I love being the ones who wanted to go right for the full push-ups. I like it. Yep, that's all, honestly, you have to do. I know those guys seem weird or anything. That's great seeing all of you doing it, by the way. Thank you. They did put a little smile on my face. 
Um, they might seem weird, but they're actually very, very helpful because you can modify those to any level of intensity you want to. You can get gradually further and further down so you can build into being able to do a full push-up or anything else that you want to. And next up, everyone should be able to do these ones. These ones are going to be squats. So we're going to have a lot of fun with this. Everyone's going to be loopy, just bad shoulder width apart. You're going to put those hands nice right in front of you and glass right in front here. Go. And then all you're going to be doing is you're going to be going down and sticking that butt out as far as you can. And everyone, let's see it. Go down and stick that butt out. Let's go. Nice and low. Yep. Up. Yeah, we're doing 10 of these. Come on. Let's go. Two. Nice. Nice and slow. Three. The slower you do them, the better they're going to be for you. Four. Let's go. Five. Perfect. Oh yeah, nice and low. I love it, everybody. Stick those booties out. Come on. Let's go. I can keep going. This is awesome. I'm loving seeing it. Yeah, yeah, great. Perfect. Anybody counting? Because I stopped. I don't know. Awesome. Alright, that's my payback a little bit for making me do all that work. So thank y'all so much for doing it and participating in it. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, see, exercise has to be fun. It doesn't have to be boring or anything like that. Get your staff, your other people doing it. Have a fun little time with it, essentially. That's all it has to be. And so with that being said, I'm going to kind of take a little break from doing the workouts and uh, talk about nutrition a little bit here. All right. Nutrition is going to be a nice quick one for us, but I do talk about these really important key points for it. Uh, everything in moderation. I'm sure everybody's heard that 10 million times now but it is going to be key. Ooh, my breath is not there, holy crap. Ah, great. So, this next little diagram up there, you can see the red line and the green line. Which one do you guys think is better, the red or the green? Green. Green, all right, I like that. Everyone's right on. <laughs> so, the green one's gonna represent what happens to your blood sugar levels and your insulin response when you have things that are healthy for you. Things like fruits, veggies, and everything that has a fiber to help regulate that sugar intake. In particular, fruits and veggies have a fiber called pectin, and essentially that just makes it so your body doesn't have that massive jump in insulin that we see from the processed sugars. So with the processed sugars we see from the red line there, uh, your blood sugar level goes through the roof, insulin comes in and it tanks it straight back down. And you can see when at that very bottom curve, we are not even halfway through just having that uh, that one response, you already had a negative there. And you're going to want to eat again at that negative. As soon as your blood sugar levels get below a certain point, your body says, I am hungry, I need food to eat, and I need something now. So that starvation point, or that massive dip in blood sugar because of that insulin response, is going to make you constantly eat throughout the entire day. That's why when you have something sugary, you feel hungry again within the next 20 to 30 minutes. Whereas if you had a solid full meal that has complex carbs in it, has proteins in it, you're going to feel full and satiated a lot longer. And the two golden rules here. Meals should gradually decrease in size. Breakfast should be your largest meal. I know that makes me very happy. I have my six eggs every single morning. It's fantastic. <laughs> oh, but so that is going to be key there. You start off nice and big and get nice and small as you progress throughout the day. The reason that is, is because as we progress throughout the day, our metabolic rate actually changes. So in the morning, our metabolic rate is going to get as high as it's going to get its most optimal functioning. And then as we get closer and closer to the end of the day, your body is no longer going to be optimized as it was when you first woke up, essentially. All the cells that you broke down throughout the day might not quite be repaired yet. Uh, as your metabolism is going to be a lot lower going at the end of it. So when you structure your meals that way, so you have a large meal intake at the beginning and a small one at the end, it can also help your sleep and establishing that schedule that you can see is the second key here. Establishing a schedule alone will do all these things for you. Reduce inflammation, so any swelling or anything like that you're noticing when you're waking up or anything else like that can be reduced by putting meals on schedule. I'm not telling you to change the size of your meals the way you're having, just putting them on a schedule. So you're eating them at the same time every day, or roughly the same time every day, and you're eating roughly the same size meals, so your body knows what to expect. And that goes right into the improved circadian rhythm. The improved circadian rhythm is your circadian rhythm is going to be anything in your body 
uh, that's set to an internal clock, essentially. Your body literally has one of those. If for some reason you can tell that it's been 44 minutes since I started this presentation, or about 45 minutes there, that's your internal clock telling you that. Uh, and that rhythm is set based on the things that you eat, your sleep schedule, uh, and all these other interactions you don't necessarily think about. So if we can let our body not think about it by having that set schedule, it frees up to do a lot more. Next one being the increase in regulation of autophagy, that's basically just going to be uh, your body's process of consuming its own cells and reproducing them. It's getting rid of the ones that are starting to break down just a little bit and putting new ones out there. Increased stress resistance, I'm pretty sure we could all use that. I'm not, I'm, so with the stress resistance, that better speed schedule, that better food schedule, your body has energy on a set schedule, it knows when to use it, when not to, that can all play a role in it. And last but not least, increase modulation of your gut microbiome. So for me, I know I have a lot of uh, uh, digestion issues. I'm allergic to garlic and onions. I can make you all cry if you want. Uh, <laughs> so being on a schedule really does help me. There's garlic and onions in everything. But if I could be on a schedule, help regulate, I don't have as, work, uh, as bad of a, a reaction to those things because my body can deal with it and has the energy to do so. That's going to be about it for the presentation here, everybody. But we do have one last thing here at the end, if you want. So as you've been uh, I'm sure wondering, I do have a whole bunch of signs sitting out here. Questions yeah. before we go. How tight should that schedule be? <coughs> An eight-hour span or a six-hour span? Gosh, okay. So if that one's going to be a lot. Uh, it's going to be up for debate. Right. Right? It is going to be. You want to make sure that you have at least three hours at the end of the night, or um, when the last time you ate and you went to bed. And then from there, it depends on your schedule for what you're doing. Typically, you're going to want to eat within about an hour and a half to two hours of waking. Uh, so if that is your schedule, there's no real time frame. Those, those are going to be the two main eat points there. Is you're going to want to eat within two hours of waking up, and you're going to want to not eat within three hours of waking up. That schedule right there should be changing for everybody. But that is going to be the rough estimate. What do you feel about fasting? Fasting, uh, so. Part of the reason that you don't uh, eat before you go to bed is actually so that you can induce a fasting, uh, a rest of fasting state. You need that uh, to be part of the of your day and to develop those circadian rhythms that I was talking about. Because your body wants to be in a fasted state when you wake up. That's where the whole term breakfast comes from. It comes with not breaking your fast. Uh, so you, and people knew that even way back when, when they were just giving names to these different meals and everything like that. They didn't know why. But for some reason, when you ate after you woke up and you had a schedule and you weren't one fifty before you went to bed, you felt better. Uh, so that's where that one gets established. So like, fasting is very key, but part of it is saying that you need to fast for 12, 15 hours, not so much. As long as your body is on those schedules and is getting certain amounts of food over a certain amount of time that you can expect and rely on, you should be okay. So that answers. Yeah. Um, when you eat first and fat breakfast, uh, there's a lot of um, protein and fat per meal that you really have to But in the brewing world, you're especially with Dr. Back inside, you're going to be tasting beer in the morning. Yep. Uh, it's like you kind of high base. Is there any kind of thing or advice on how to balance it out? How to balance it out. So, my one tip for that is yes, obviously if you're going to be uh, testing or having a beer or doing anything like that first thing in the morning, uh, you, can, you can account for that. I'm not telling you not to drink or anything else like that to change what you're doing or anything, but just putting it on that schedule, on that schedule. So if you, even if you just had your breakfast and uh, you're going to uh, have or test new things out right afterwards, uh, as long as your body is on that schedule that it had its main meal already, uh, you shouldn't have any real additive or worsening effects from having that one additional uh, later on. Does that make sense? Any other fun questions for it? Fire away. I should be able to answer just about anything you got. As far as drinking goes, you said the moderation part of the job, right? Right, yep. Um, just curious what your thoughts on that. I mean, so obviously, I mean, working for a brewery myself, I definitely uh, support heavy beer in general. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's really just about uh, being aware of how much you're having, essentially. 
So even when you're testing out beers or anything like that, that doesn't mean you need to have a full pint. You can still do your sample sizes, et cetera. You can do a set of tastings. Um, so it's really just about being mindful, essentially, on that, how much you're consuming. We talked about the numbers where you get the health benefits from it and where it starts getting detrimental. Uh, so now that so if you're aware of those numbers, you can kind of keep track of, of yourself is the way I like to look at that. Uh, obviously, I'm going to support trying new beers, having new beers, they're fantastic. You get health benefits from it, but just don't going over is the uh, main thing. Yeah. I love the six exercises. Love the six exercises. Oh, sure. Fun. Do you have any other things like that throughout the day where you're just like, I don't know, every time you're looking at the CIP to a tank, you're like stretching? Yeah. Like, Honestly, I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's, <laughs> I see if I can flex or stretch different muscles while I'm doing different things to see how they're engaged and everything. So yeah, that's exactly what I do. Constant thought all day. Mark. It pretty much is. Yeah, I, uh, I used to do bodybuilding myself, so like I got really into being able to control the muscles themselves. So being able to actually uh, feel those stretches or feel that pull on muscle is what I'm always mindful of. Honestly. And recommendations for builders who don't actually work in a brewery are car happy day sales. Car happy day, yeah, got some great recommendations actually. So I didn't get the chance to talk about it too much today, uh, but stretching is going to be your key one for you there. Uh, the insertion points on your lower back into your, into your legs and your glutes are going to be the ones in particular that you're going to want to look for. Uh, because people don't think about your glutes, your hamstrings tying into your lower back or anything like that, but they do. Uh, there's direct insertion points right there, your lower back to your hips, uh, that you need to be aware of and pay attention to. So if you can stretch your hamstrings and your glutes, you'll find that your lower back may be sitting in a car all day, and most likely you will. Any others here? Or? Who are the signs for? What's that? What? Who are the signs for? <laughs> Sign. All right, now we can get into it. Perfect. This is the fun one here, you know, so you can then. Uh, we're going to get right into it. Uh, so I'm going to have a sign holding contest up here for anyone who wants to participate. Because yes, that is physical activity. Holding this sign, how much fun yet, is physical activity. It can be fun. And to make it even better, I do have some prizes up here for the people who do win and hold the signs the longest. So make it a little bit of a competition. So if anybody is interested in uh, doing the sign holding contest, I'll make them up and start pulling this in line. Cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah